obtain and cross over to create a master list, voting, and driver's license. Those are the two. So you're like, I'm never going to be on a jury. Don't vote. Don't drive. That'll show, that'll show that government. Yeah, I mean... Not a lot. It's not, it's not like it's great. Mostly they're one-day trials, but yeah, maybe a couple. Sometimes if you're on a grand jury, you could be serving a month or two. Do you get paid a lot? No. Okay? No. It's kind of, for me, it's a little bit of a hassle because it's no big deal if it's in the summertime, but if it's for a school shh, during the school week, I've got uh, to plan for subs for every single day of that week because potentially, yeah, it is kind of a hassle that way. Anyway, um, for an infraction, write this down. For an infraction, like most speeding cases are simply infractions and so forth, you are not entitled to a jury. You're entitled to just a judge, the so-called court trial. If you were wanting to waive your jury trial right, you could. And just have the judge determine your guilt or innocence. I wouldn't recommend it though. Okay? Because the judge, how many people you need to persuade to uh, uh, rule in your favor to find you not guilty? One. Just one. Mm -hmm. Out of a 12 or 16 or 6 person jury, how many people is required? To, to basically have you like not found guilty at that particular stage? All it takes is one. Just one, okay? And, by the way, make sure you have this down. They need to be unanimous in criminal cases. And actually, there was a few states that used to do it where you could do like 9 out of 12 or 10 out of 12 or something like that. But the Supreme Court now has made it quite clear it's got to be unanimous for a guilty verdict. Okay? All right. There you go. Do, 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 do. Yeah, and most cases are resolved by guilty pleas most of the time person pleads guilty, the prosecution's like, okay, you plead guilty, I will ask for no more than this for a sentence. Or maybe I'll drop some of the smaller charges or whatever. It's called plea bargaining between the prosecution and the defense attorney. Okay, let's go to the next one. Eighth Amendment. Back to the Eighth Amendment here. This is Eighth Amendment, cruel or unusual punishment. Cruel or unusual. All right. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to double check because my slide has and, and I've written down or. What makes something cruel and unusual? That's a good question. <laughs> Whoops. That's not unusual. And, and, okay? And. Yes, it has to be both. So correct my little thing. Good eye. And unusual. All right, so here we go. So, <clears throat> notice this. Shh, you ready? Criminal punishment, Ivan, could be very effective because usually what courts want is that the criminal punishment be effective to deter the crime from taking a place again, either from that person or from somebody else. Okay? It could be punitive. Shame on you, you're going to be punished here. Got that? But it effective. Oh my gosh, I can come up with all kinds of things. If you cut people's fingers off, okay, or cut their hand off, or just like torture them or something like that, that could be very effective. It could be very punitive. You could feel like, wow, that guy's really getting punished. In fact, write this down. On the side, there are some countries, um, not as many now, that do like really like, mm, let's be um, cruel about this. Innovative. Pakistan, for example. I remember reading about Pakistan. They had a sentencing component, right? The punishment that said whatever method you use as a criminal may be used against you. So there was a murderer who I think had chopped up uh, the victim's bodies and dissolved them in acid. Yeah. And so they, the same thing happened to them in that particular situation. Do you understand that? Hmm? How are you going to get chopped up while being alive? With no, I meant like, was he physically alive while they were chopped up? 
I don't think so. I think they, I think they killed him. But anyway, it was really awful. Yeah. So yes, moving along. <clears throat> now here's one. Write this down. Singapore. Singapore has a very interesting situation whereby they use caning, physical punishment, also known as corporal punishment. Um, caning, C-A-N-I-N-G. Okay. So you take, you equip them. You like take out their bare backside or, or, or whatever, their, their bottom or something, and just whack. Whack. You got that? Whack, 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 whack. You can put this down. You ready? In the United States of America, psh, corporal punishment caning is deemed by the United States Supreme Court to be unconstitutional. And it's cruel and it's unusual. Okay. Although some people in this country, because this happened to an American teenager who keyed a bunch of cars in Singapore, <laughs> he was an American. He was, uh, he was in uh, Singapore. What law is going to be applied to him? <laughs> Singapore law. And he's like, oh, no, because they ordered him to be caned. And the uh, parents were like, oh, well, he did really bad. He shouldn't have done that and so forth, you know. But in America, he would never get caned. And we never caned him. And the Singapore officials were like, this yeah, this ain't America. Exactly. This is not America. Okay, so you can't be too clever, right? There was one guy, I want to say, in one of the states uh, of this country, and he was, I think he was a repeat sex offender, and he basically said to the judge, yeah, go ahead and chemically castrate me or something like that so that he'll never behave in a bad way and so forth. Again, they were thinking, well, that might actually be pretty effective, but would that be cruel and unusual punishment? Okay. Well, interesting question. No, actually, Caden brings up the thing. Can you just waive your right and cruel and unusual punishment and just like, go ahead and do your worst? I don't think so. Shh. It's a good question. Write that down. I don't think so. Okay? I think this is one where it's like you're saying something about the society and your criminal justice system and so forth. It's no big deal. It's not like, oh, it's cruel that somebody waived the right to have a jury trial within a year. You know, it's going to be two weeks later. As opposed to, you know, <laughs> you're right against, I mean, no, no, no. Of uh, being a justice with, like, the most innovative, like, uh, criminal sentencing and so forth. No, no, I, I see the, the, the one on trial. <laughs> Actually, here's one for you. You ready? Shh. Here's one for you. Because we're, we're going to get into the death penalty thing. Write this down. Death penalty. Okay? Shh. Death penalty. Once, <clears throat> Death penalty. Once upon a time, the United States um, Supreme Court had basically put a stop to all death penalty um, executions. All right? Then they pulled back a bit, and they were like, okay, we're going to leave it up to the states. They may do this. Now, there's going to be parameters, and I'll get to some of the parameters. But one of them, I want to say, this was in the late 70s, um, a guy in Utah was facing the death penalty. And he's like, bring your best. It's kind of like Caden was saying, bring it. And within the death penalty statute of uh, Utah, you had a choice, and one of them was a firing squad, okay? And he asked for the firing squad. I think that's available, but not in too many states as a choice. And, he, cause, and he's just like, bring it. I'm going to make you do it. I'm going to make you pull the trigger. And the firing squad typically has involved several uh, executioners all pointing at the, uh, uh, the, d the defendant's heart to basically, you know, have it done, okay? What's that? That's the idea. I mean, he basically was like, we're going to make you do this. Put this down, though. Once upon a time, historically, you know, people were burned to death. Nope, can't do that anymore. Uh, people were torn limb from limb. Nope, that's cruel and unusual punishment, okay? The electric chair has been found pretty much to be cruel and unusual punishment throughout the country because it was so unreliable, and instead of killing somebody very quickly in a humane manner, it would fry them. Watch The Green Mile if you never watched that movie before. That is like, yeah, oh. So anyway, so here's the deal. In states that allow for the death penalty, cruel and unusual punishment analysis also goes on the form of the death penalty. So most states, they pretty much stick to lethal injection. And there's all kinds of different variables and so forth as whether or not that's cruel or unusual or is it or isn't it not. One thing to consider, though, is the United States is one of not too many, do I have that slide here? No, I don't. Um, not too many uh, countries in the world that still allow for the death penalty, okay? 
We have a federal death penalty on some U.S. crimes, very serious U.S. crimes. And then look at the map here. I don't know how updated this is here, but many states, including Idaho, still have, excuse me, the death penalty as an option to carry out in severe cases. Now, I can tell you this, and some of you guys may recall, there are death penalty cases, capital punishment. You can write that down if you didn't know that. Capital punishment is not punishment that occurs in, a, in the capital city of a, of a state or a country. Capital punishment equals death penalty. There are some capital punishment cases that existed when I was a deputy prosecutor back in the early 90s. And those people have still not been put to death. Okay? Those cases have gone on and on and on. I told you about one where the guy was found guilty of murdering two people in a bar on State Street, took a baseball bat and dashed their brains all over the wall and so forth. And he was found guilty. He was given the death penalty. And the death penalty was carried out within one, like a year or so. Why? He waived his right to appeal. Okay? He waived his right to appeal. He's like, the death penalty is there. You're going to be executing me. I don't want to rot in prison for, I don't know, 30 years or more. So he was executed in the state of Idaho. Okay, do you got that? Here are some of the variables that the Supreme Court has been looking at, that people have been looking at. One, age. And they've drawn a bright line on the issue of age. If a person committed the crime that would otherwise warrant the death penalty under the age of 18, the Supreme Court has issued a bright line rule. No death penalty. Do you got that? So if you killed somebody, and that's the, that's the uh, serious crime, and you were under 18, they're not going to give you the death penalty. Could you get life in prison? <laughs> yeah, I think that would be probably what's going to be coming in. committed. Okay? Because you notice that the process could carry out so that you might turn 18 at some point along the process. So the date they look for is when it was committed. Okay? Here's one that's a little bit more hard to pin down. You ready? The, I don't know how you would refer to it, I guess the developmental age of the defendant. You know what I mean by developmental age? Okay? So somebody could have the IQ of a 10-year-old, but be actually 25 years old. If the defense attorney is able to show convincingly to the judge that their client is not an adult for the purpose, mentally an adult, for the purpose of having a death penalty carried out, then the Supreme Court said, you may not execute them. Do you understand that? So those are kind of the bright line rules that have been put in place with respect to the death penalty. Other kinds of things, it's got to be a really serious thing. You're, you're like, well, we could stop speeding if we had instantaneous capital punishment on the freeway. <laughs> I mean, that's like, that's like this sort of post-apocalyptic kind of movies. I mean, it's like, oh my, like Judge Dredd or I don't know, in some of those kinds of things and so forth, you know. No. The Eighth Amendment, it's kind of like, all right, back in the medieval time periods, you know, crowds would come out. There really wasn't anything on cable. Or, you know, streaming services were really bad. So they came out for, to see somebody racked or hung or all kinds of terrible things like that. I mean, that was part of their entertainment. And here's another thing. Write this down. Shh. Once upon a time, this is an important component. Once upon a time, we didn't put much money in our resources into police, law enforcement. One of the reasons we do law enforcement is to provide a deterrence, as in somebody's about to commit a crime and they're like, uh-oh, I see a police officer, I'm going to get caught, maybe I won't do it. So we changed the calculation. Once upon a time, because you weren't likely to get caught, they wrapped up the punishment. So you could get hung for stealing somebody's horse. We really wanted to discourage people from stealing somebody else's horses, because if you lose your horse in the middle of nowhere, you could be dead. And they weren't going to catch all the horse thieves. So when they did catch some horse thieves, they're like, yeah, where are you going to pay the penalty for all the horse thieves that got away from it? Now, here's the calculation. Do communities want to, like, ramp up the punishment? 
or just deter the crime by having more police officers and community police and just try to discourage folks. Well, and, and the irony is, if you reduce the, the size of your police department considerably, what might you see go up in your community? You might see more crime. And so you're like, you've got to make smart decisions. Because if you have too much crime, it goes back to something we covered in the very beginning of government class. Can a government stand if it has domestic insecurity and the people are dissatisfied and they find the government illegitimate? No. Yeah, with the Soviet Union, I mean, they had all kinds of problems ultimately. But, yeah, communist China. Are they illegitimate? What do they do about domestic insecurity? And so I've heard that people who, China does have the death penalty. And some of the people who have the death penalty in China, sometimes their body parts are harvested. And provided to other people who are in need of a fresh liver, a fresh set of kidneys, or something like that. Oh, that's scary. This is depressing. All right, next one. This one's not too controversial. Okay, you ready? The right to subpoena a witness. Okay? The right to subpoena a witness. All right, here we go. Phone a friend. <laughs> Well, do you want to be the perp in this situation? All right, here we go. Let's look at the thing. Caden is the perp. He is the defendant. All right. So, Caden, I'm your defense attorney. All right, I want to know who really did it. No, 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 no. Who really did it? Who? Lizzie did it. Okay, so here's the deal. Shh. You ready? Ready? Get this. So, you have a right to subpoena witnesses. Write this down. The defendant will provide a list of all the people that have to show up at the trial to go under oath and answer questions. You got that? And presumably, if they're on your list, they're going to be providing information that is helpful to you. So you'd be found not guilty. <laughs> and Lizzie, I mean, <laughs> here's the deal. You're like, oh, this is just so grand. This is going to be so awesome. I'm going to bring the person subpoena. What happens if you don't show up at the trial after you've been subpoenaed? Yeah, you're in violation of a court order. Write that down. If you have been subpoenaed for a trial, prosecution or defense, the court has issued an order, and you're in contempt of court, you're in violation of that subpoena, you could go to jail on that alone. Do you understand that? So, Lizzie gets a subpoena. She's subpoenaed to just show up at Caden's trial. She's like, oh no, this could be really bad, because she's thinking to herself, I really did it. He, he's taking the fall. <laughs> and I don't want to answer any questions. I don't want to, I don't want to help him out because if I testified truthfully as to what really went down, Caden would be found not guilty and you would be charged with a crime. You don't want that to happen, do you? So here she comes, having consulted with her attorney because, you know, people who do serious crimes and so forth, they're very wise if they want to stay in the crime business to continue consulting with an attorney. You've talked to your mob attorney, excuse me, your, uh, your uh, attorney. <laughs> And what, what advice did you give? What did you, <laughs> what advice, what advice, because I think we can all figure this out. At the trial, when Caden's attorney, Gabe, comes up to Lizzie and asks questions like, <laughs> No, oh, you're a terrible attorney. Oh, my gosh, seriously, have you not been paying attention? Do you want to lie under oath? No. Oh my gosh, raise your hand, somebody who can give me proper advice to Lizzie with respect to when Lizzie is asked questions. Go for it. Yeah. Okay, well, we know that. That's like before the thing. She has to show up. All right. Shh. Lizzie already knows this. She's shown up in trial. Seriously, Caden's going to give the proper legal advice. He's the one who wants uh, Lizzie to, like, go, oh, I did it. You know, like, have you guys ever seen, shh, have you ever seen Legally Blonde, right? Great trial scene where the uh, person inadvertently, like, ends up, like, confessing to the crime and so forth. You remember the, the scene about the perm and so forth? I was trying to kill you. 
Oops, did I say something? Oops, gosh, do I have to be Mirandize? So here's the deal. Do you think you have an answer? She's under, she is bis, she's just been called to the stand, and Caden's attorney is asking her a simple question. Did you kill the person who Caden is charged with killing? She answers the question. Is that the best thing that she should do? Thank you. Oh my gosh, plead the fifth. Do you have an obligation to answer that question? Because if you answer that question, particularly if you answer it truthfully, you would be self-incriminating. You would be saying something that would harm your situation. You just say, I plead the fifth. Shh. I cannot answer that question on the grounds that it might incriminate me. It happens all the time. So what? Okay. So what? Are you going to be thrown in jail? For an, no. All right. So we'll take a couple of questions. Okay, go ahead, Owen. Lie if you could be charged with perjury if it is a substantial lie on a very important fact. Hi. Who? Jake. Jake. Oh, Jacob. Jake. Okay. Okay, Jake. All right, thank you. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Oh, my gosh. Actually, I'll deal with that very, very quickly, okay? It's a separate thing. You ready? Write this down. It's a separate thing. Most states, in fact, I don't think, mo most states do not have an opportunity to plead insane, okay? Which does, just handle it, okay? So, in other words, it doesn't give the jury an opportunity to find somebody um, not guilty on reasons of insanity. But, here's the deal. If you're going to commit a crime, you actually, the, the prosecution does need to show, in a sense, that you had enough of a clear mind that you were actually able to consider doing what you did. Juries don't like to find people. Shh, please. Juries don't like to find people not guilty on reasons of insanity because they're like, oh, it looks like they're getting away with it. But, I mean, it could be an issue. Somebody shot, nearly killed President Reagan. The jurisdiction that had that trial allowed him to plead not guilty. Actually, allowed the jury to find him not guilty by reason of insanity. And that's what they did. I mean, the evidence was clear. He was, he was filmed shooting the president and his press secretary and a police officer and a Secret Service agent. I mean, there was no doubt that John Hinckley did what he was charged with doing. But they found him not guilty on reasons of insanity and immediately the jurisdiction took him into custody because it was a danger to himself and others and held him in custody for, I want to say, like 30-some-plus years. It was only very recently released. So it's not very usual for somebody to be found uh, not guilty by reason of insanity, here and then there. Because it's a movie, yeah. Because it's a movie. I mean, Legally Blonde is a really enjoyable movie. There's so many flaws in there. It's like, or unlikelihoods, but nevertheless, it's sort of like light, frilly, haha. -ha. And yeah, it's entertainment value. But yeah, I mean, don't sit, if you want to, if you want to like not fully be engaged in a movie uh, that has a trial scene in it, sit next to an attorney because they'll be like, you know, critiquing, going, "That's not going to happen. No, no, that's all wrong," and so forth. And you're like, "Shut up," you know. But you can talk to them afterwards. And that's usually what they'll do. They'll tell you afterwards. Couldn't happen. Doesn't matter. Oh, I mean, actually, it's a good question. As far as, like, you subpoena someone, where is the subpoena going to be served? Within an area in the United States. And it can be very difficult. Can you serve subpoenas in other parts of the world? Not necessarily. This gets to kind of a question of extradition. Usually... What the defendant, as well as the prosecution, is going to try and do is arrange for those witnesses to be there, like, voluntarily. 
Okay, so that might be one reason why you say, Your Honor, we're going to waive our right to a speedy trial for a month because we have a critical witness that can't be here, COVID times, uh, and so they can be here in a month's time and we want them there. Okay? All right. Next one. Ex post facto law. Let's go ahead and do that one real quickly. Oh my gosh, that's the last one of the criminal justice rights. I think this one's straightforward. You've already learned it. It is a criminal justice right. If the court tries, if a government tries to charge you with a crime, and when you did it, it wasn't a crime, although it is now, they can't do that. That's like after the fact. That's not fair. Does that make sense? Does this confuse anyone? No, I, I like this part. I just threw it in there because it's like, well, that's a criminal justice right, you know? And it's pretty straightforward, okay? All right, now let's get to something <laughs> that is going to be really fun. All right. The last section. Here we go. The right to privacy. Ladies and gentlemen, write this down. We're going to be covering this in great detail. In fact, next time we're going to get quite a bit into the issue of abortion. wasn't sure if we were going to get to that today. Okay? But before we get to abortion, we have to talk about the Griswolds. Here we go. Yeah, we got, we got three minutes. The Griswolds. Ready? Because it all started with the Griswolds. Here they are. Now, these are the Griswolds from the movie uh, Animal House Vacation, in which it was really strange because I think they did three Animal House, or National Lampoon's Vacation, not Animal House, National Lampoon's Vacation. I think they did three different versions. And they have the same married couple, but the kids keep changing. I mean, don't those like, parents really know who their kids are? Because they always have these different actors that play the role of the kids. Anyway, they're called the Griswolds in that movie. They have nothing to do with the Griswolds in the Connecticut case involving birth control. You ready? In Connecticut, once upon a time, there was a law. And it was passed a long time ago. I want to say like the late 1800s in the state of Connecticut, which reflected the view of most of the people living there, who happened to be Catholic, and they basically had the view that they didn't want people to use um, prophylactic devices as a form of preventing pregnancy. Huh? No condoms. No birth control of any kind. So basically, the view was, what they want, if, if something was going to happen that potentially could lead to a pregnancy, well then, let it happen. And so they passed a law, and the law of Connecticut said, no birth control devices available for purchase in any, by anyone in the state of Connecticut. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's like, this was a birth control device, and so here's the deal. The Griswolds, they could have done two things. One, they could have, and it might have worked. They could have gone to the legislature of Connecticut and said, that's really old-fashioned. Can we just get that law changed? But here's what happened. They went to the courts. And with some clever arguments, ultimately, they persuaded the United States Supreme Court to say, bada-bing. There it is. 1965, Griswold versus Connecticut. There is a right of privacy for married couples and married couples alone in making decisions with respect to whether or not they have children to purchase birth control and that is a constitutional right. Where did that come from? Next time we will look into the analysis of Griswold versus Connecticut, a very limited right of privacy and we're going to get into questions of penumbras and emanations and we'll look at the First and Fourth Amendments and, yeah, you guys are going to learn a lot. It'll be good. Okay? So, right of privacy, and then we'll go from there to abortion issue. Okay?